Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alexander Sikorsky, and I'm the student vice president of the Buckley program. Uh, thank you all for coming on this lovely afternoon. Uh, before I introduce our guests uh, for today's debate, I'd like to say a few words about the Buckley program. Uh, the Buckley program is dedicated to the promotion of intellectual diversity on Yale's campus. We host lectures, debates, and conferences with guests who hold views that diverge from campus orthodoxy and challenge Yale students on their principles. To freshmen, upperclassmen, and grad students who are not yet involved in the Buckley program, I highly recommend that you visit buckleyprogram.com to learn more about becoming a Buckley Fellow. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing, introducing our guests. Rebecca Heinrichs is a senior fellow at Hudson Institute, where she provides research and commentary on a range of national security issues and specializes in nuclear deterrence, missile defense, and counterproliferation. Her work has appeared in major newspapers, such as the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Times, and Investors Business Daily. Mrs. Heinrichs serves as an advisor on, the nat on national security and foreign policy uh, to Representative Trent Franks, a member of the House Armed Services Committee, and helped launch the Bipartisan Missile Defense Caucus. David Ottaway is a senior f scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and a former Washington Post Middle East correspondent. He worked for 35 years as a foreign correspondent in the Middle East, Africa, and Southern Europe, and later as a national security and investigative reporter in Washington before retiring in 2006. He has won numerous awards for his reporting at home and abroad, and was twice nominated as a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. His most recent book, published in November 2008, was The, King Messenger, the King's Messenger, Prince Bandar bin Sultan and America's mm -hmm. Tangled Relationship with Saudi Arabia. He is currently working on a book regarding the changes underway in the Arab world. Today, Mrs. Heinrichs and Mr. Ottaway will debate Trump's policy on Saudi Arabia. We will begin with five-minute opening statements from each of our speakers, followed by several uh, questions from me, the moderator. Um, each of our guests will have the chance to respond, and after about 30 minutes, we'll open up the debate to audience questions. Um, so with that, let's give a warm welcome to uh, Rebecca Heinrichs and David Ottaway. Yeah, it's good to see you. Um, so with that, I would like to uh, begin with Mr. Ottaway. You have five minutes for an opening statement. Okay, when I think about Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia which I go to every year now, and um, about to produce a book partly on Saudi Arabia, um, the first thing I'm struck about in any discussion of Saudi Arabia is that we have to look at the where we stand overall in the region, and where does Saudi Arabia fit into an overall policy. Unfortunately, all our friends, allies, partners, whatever you want to call them, are very problematic right now. And when I say the region, I mean all the way to Afghanistan, to Syria, which is the area that the U.S. Central Command overseas uh, from Qatar, one of our Arab friends, allies, partners. <laughs> um, we've cut our, off our aid to Pakistan. We are about to dump the government in Kabul uh, and make a deal with the Taliban. Um, we have, Trump already wanted to withdraw in Syria and said get out. He's now uh, agreed to maybe 400 troops staying on. In Iraq, the parliament is shortly going to debate and probably pass legislation to kick most of the Americans out of Iraq. In Egypt, we have a man who has locked up 40,000 of his opponents, and he's sitting on a sort of time bomb and has failed to deal with his domestic challenges. So all our allies, except Israel, and who knows what's going to happen in the election in a couple of weeks, are in serious difficulty. Um, our problem is we don't have a strategy of how to deal with this. We don't know what our objectives are going to be if we are withdrawing our troops from all these countries. What, what then are our interests? What then are our objectives? And what are our plans to fulfill those objectives? We need a new Middle East policy. Question, should Saudi Arabia still be central to a new US Middle East policy? Um, this is the question I keep de 
debating with myself, let alone with, <laughs> with Rebecca and you, um, you all. Um, I find myself really conflicted. I've been going to Saudi Arabia since 1976 and um, wrote a book about the Saudi ambassador in the United States, Prince Sultan, and the whole U.S.-Saudi relationship really since the 1973 oil boycott. And it's been up and downs and up and downs. And um, when 9-11 uh, when happened, I was covering it from Washington um, the Saudi involvement, because 15 of the 19 hijackers were Saudis. And um, we really reached a low in our relationship. And in Washington, after 2001, I don't know how many conferences I went to where the title was Saudi Arabia Friend or Foe. And I feel that's happening again today in Congress, in the media, um, and even among some uh, strategists or policy makers. Now, what used to hold us together, sort of the golden keystone, was Saudi oil for United States umbrella, protection umbrella over Saudi Arabia. That whole uh, central pillar has collapsed. We're now rivals with the Saudi Arabia on oil. We're producing more oil than the Saudi Arabia's. Trump is trying to force the price down. The Saudis are trying to force it up. Uh, we're, we're now rivals in, in, the, in the oil world. And um, that, so that whole p pillar has collapsed. And the security part, we have encouraged our allies out there to go defend themselves. 30 seconds. We will help five. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. <laughs> um, so the old, the old things that held us together briefly are no longer there. We need to find and redefine our relationship to Saudi Arabia. But first, we need to have a policy to figure out where Saudi Arabia fits into that overall policy. Thank you very much. Ms. Heinrich. Sure. Uh, real quick, thank you all for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and kudos to you for having the two of us here to talk about this complex issue and to welcome the, uh, the debate and free and open um, you know, exchange of ideas. Uh, very good. It's commendable. Um, so I'll just begin by saying that um, I, I don't think it's too strong to say that Saudi Arabia is the United States' most important strategic partner in mitigating and rolling back Iran's power and malign activities throughout the region. Um, this is an approach the Trump administration has been very intentional about. It's very different than the previous administration, which looked for an opportunity to um, moderate the Iranian regime by uh, negotiating what is uh, called the Iran deal or the JCPOA. Um, Iran, of course, is not only a great adversary of the United States, it is the major adversary of Saudi Arabia. And so in Saudi Arabia, the United States has found somebody um, of which we have a very shared common uh, enemy. And so uh, we've looked to the Saudis to help the United States in countering Iran's power and malign activities throughout the region. Um, uh, and while it's true that the United States is becoming energy independent, it is still inextricably tied to the global market and our Asian allies rely on Saudi oil. And um, the stability and diversification of the energy market is a critical factor in matters of war and peace, whether we like it or not. Iran has repeatedly brandished its ability to affect the energy market by, for example, threatening to close the Strait of Hormuz. And so it's not about what, who's going to be exporting more oil to the United States or Saudi Arabia. It's about is Saudi Arabia going to be a stable and reliable exporter of um, Gulf petroleum and keeping those, those lanes open um, to, to keep the, the global energy market stable. Uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, to that end, leads the Gulf Coalition in maritime security to keep critical shipping lanes open. And should the United States and allies like Saudi Arabia lose control of the security of those shipping lanes, countries like Iran and its increasingly bold partners, large nuclear powers, China and Russia, would greatly be empowered to more effectively blackmail and coerce the United States and our allies by having control over those regions th through their proxy, Iran. Every government of every sovereign nation is primarily responsible for the care of its own people. 
So as the United States looks to um, the region and how is what, what as the Trump administration tries to have a more disciplined approach to our relationships and the region, we have to think first and foremost, what is going to increase um, uh, security for the United States, prosperity for the United States, and, and so far, um, it, has, it has really pinned this approach on Saudi Arabia um, for that, that, those two pieces, the energy market, keeping those lanes open, trying to make sure that the uh, Russians and the Chinese don't have that coercive power, and to uh, defang the Iranians. Also, our normal counterterrorism operations as well. And then, um, lastly, you have an opportunity here um, to take, uh, for, for the for the Arab world and then the Muslim world to take a softer, more reasonable approach to Israel. Um, under MBS, the, the young crown prince, Mohammed, um, we see an opportunity here. He has now said that he believes the Israelis have a right to their own land, like the Palestinians do, but this softening approach is huge and has huge implications um, for peace in that region. And then, of course, that peace then affects the United States as well. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity here, and part of what the young prince has said that he wants to do to, to, um, to move his country in the right direction, this is never, or I shouldn't say never, but um, the, the prince has never said that he's going to make this an open and democratic country, but he is moving towards a more just society by relaxing some of these um, very oppressive restraints on women, allowing women um, the opportunity to vote, or to, uh, wish to vote, to, um, to drive. And I, I was in Saudi Arabia in 2008 because I was a congressional staffer at the time, and I was concerned about the Bush administration's massive foreign military sale of JDAMs to the Saudis. And those are just JDAM kits make dumb bombs, dumb bombs, smart bombs. And I was concerned um, that we were doing that without requiring some human rights reforms and change. Um, and now, um, one of the major concerns I, that, that I talked to, I talked to women in Saudi at the time, they wanted the ability to drive. 30 seconds. And the ability to drive is not merely symbolic. A lot of Americans like to just make it seem like it's a symbolic thing. Driving gives women independence. You give them independence, they're going to demand more independence. Where women go in Saudi Arabia, you're going to have the entire society becoming more moderate and, 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 um, and to take care of its citizens, where you're going to have an increased ability of, for human flourishing there, and that means good things for the United States as well. So, you know, temp I'm, I'm optimistic, though realistic, about the direction under MBS, but he's a young guy, and if he continues going on the direction that he is going in terms of his reforms, we have, a, we have a, the possibility of a bright future. Uh, well, thank you very much. So the, uh, the first question I have uh, for both of you, and I hope that you will now um, debate each other and respond to each other, um, is that you actually, Ms. Andrews, you mentioned MBS, and I was surprised that neither of you in your opening statements mentioned the uh, brutal killing of Jamal uh, Khashoggi, uh, which was authored by MBS. And so my question um, for the two of you um, is, you know, how much should human rights abuses uh, factor into our calculation of deciding this alliance um, with the Saudi regime. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy to go. I'll, I'll go defer. Ahead. Okay. Um, and I would just say what happened to Khashoggi was a terrible thing. He was a Saudi citizen living in the United States, working at the Washington Post at the time. He was an opinion writer. He was not a journalist. Um, um, in, in my view, in the definition of the word, he, he was an opinion writer, guest columnist there. Um, he did not deserve the death that he had. It was a terrible thing. He was on Saudi soil in Turkey when it happened. He was a political enemy of the Saudi regime. Um, it, 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 it's terrible, and I, and I don't want to um, understate um, how in, unjust it was. Um, but that particular killing, and we don't know all of the facts, I believe, that happened at the, uh, the direction of the Saudi government, but we don't know, that according to the Saudi government, it, it, it went awry, um, and he wasn't supposed to die there. I, I don't know that, um, but it shouldn't have happened. Um, should it unravel the U.S. strategic alliance with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia? No, I don't believe that it should. If we looked at every single country in the world and judged it by our own understanding of democratic principles, of tolerance and, and due process and pluralism, we would be alone. And so I think that um, the Trump administration's measured approach, which to sanction the individuals that MBS designated as those responsible for the death, was appropriate. Um, and, and I think that we should continue press, pressing for and encouraging reforms privately and, and move on with our alliance um, as it was before the unfortunate killing took place. Uh, Jamal Khashoggi was a personal friend of mine. I've known him for decades. I, can't, I was trying to think of when I first met him. It's certainly the Gulf War of 91, maybe even in the late 80s. 
Um, he was coming to the Woodrow Wilson Center. He'd applied in June 2017 before he went into exile. And um, he didn't have the right kind of visa. He needed to be a permanent resident, and he applied for that. But by the time he was killed, he had not received the, uh, his permanent residency card, the green card. So he never actually came to the Woodrow Wilson Center, although he did participate in a number of debates there about Saudi Arabia. Um, I would agree with Rebecca that the relationship between the two countries is larger than Jamal Khashoggi. But it isn't just Jamal Khashoggi. The government has rendered, you know, rendered when you go and you see somebody and bring them home, at least a dozen others before Jamal, including one, Lou Jane uh, Lathul, who was kidnapped off the streets of Dubai, put in a plane. She's one of the women who promoted the whole campaign for driving and shipped back home. She's now in jail and on trial as we sit here talking. Eleven women are on trial in Saudi Arabia today. Three of them were released. So the larger issue is the way things were going there, this forced rendition of anybody who spoke out against or even wanted to debate what was going on in Saudi Arabia was getting worse and worse. And if this were to continue, you have to ask where, where was it going to end? We have multiple reports. The women were tortured in jail, including with a sister of, one, of Lu, Lu Jane. These are, I mean, the behavior of the Saudi government in handling, they're not even dissidents. They're people who wanted to drive a car, which they're now allowed to do, is, is something has to be done to say this cannot stand and continue. And it's up to not just the Congress, it's up to Trump to hold the crown prince responsible. And he's the one that everybody, including the CIA, said was orchestrating the whole thing. At least to say, we hold you responsible and you've got to do something to clean up your act and how you deal with any activist, male, female, whomever, that you can't keep going on like this. So, Mr. Ottaway, in your opening statement, you said that many of the things that characterize the U.S.-Saudi relationship, um, such as the um, oil interests, um, and have now relapsed. So, you know, in the, in the wake of the, in the shale gas revolution, in the wake of the 9-11 attacks, um, you argued that the, that the Saudi relationship um, needs to be uh, redefined, whereas I think um, Mrs. Heinrichs disagreed to some extent on that. Um, why do you, what, what direction do you see that the Saudi relationships, in what way do you think it should be redefined? I think so far we have two issues we, where we can still say there's some agreement on. One is confronting Iran, and the other is counterterrorism. But the more I see us, I don't see the cooperation on counterterrorism. I see it with the United Arab Emirates, where they have been going in with American commandos in Yemen and going after al-Qaeda cells in Yemen. The Saudis don't seem to be doing anything. If they are, they haven't told anybody, and nobody as I've ever talked to said that they're involved in our counterterrorism effort against al-Qaeda in Yemen. Um, I think we need what happened after 9-11. Four years later, Bush invited the then King Abdullah to Crawford, his ranch in Texas. The two sat down and they discussed the whole relationship. They set up six committees, and each, com like in the energy sector, in the economic sector, in cultural activities, uh, uh, counterterrorism, military security, and they examined where are we going, where are we, and where are we going, and how can we cooperate. That's what I think we need. Unfortunately, I don't really see Trump sitting, <laughs> organizing that kind of strategic dialogue the way Bush and King Abdullah did. But we need something like that to make very clear where our differences are and where we can work together. Now, out of the 2005 meeting came 80,000 
Saudi students studying in the United States who then have been returning by the tens of thousands and are the new base for the crown prince, the young generation. Uh, so Abdullah, who's not given the credit he should be, started this whole, I call it a social revolution of what's going on inside there uh, in terms of the uh, bringing in entertainment, allowing people to relax, go to wrestling matches. <laughs> the world, <laughs> it's, it, they really, the young generation really appreciates this and they're very supportive of, of the crown prince and his domestic reforms. Not to mention that he's put back in their box all the Wahhabi clerics who were causing all the trouble in terms of social progress. If I, if I, if I may just say too, um, I, think, I think what would be helpful for Americans who are watching what's happening with Saudi Arabia right now and the U.S. relationship to it, um, even beyond this administration, you want to watch MBS and you don't, do not grade the reforms in Saudi Arabia against the United States. You grade the reforms in Saudi Arabia against, the, against where it was five years ago, 10 years ago. When I was there 10 years ago, um, I'm, sure I'm not going to pronounce this right because it's in Arabic, but, the, um, but maybe where the Mutawin, the religious police, the Muta Muta yeah. Mutawin or Muta that's the religious police. Those are the, those are the guys that were empowered by the clerics to go around and enforce these, um, the, the very hard dress codes, much stricter in Riyadh than they were in Jeddah. Um, but no longer, they, do no, they no longer have the, uh, the authority to make arrests. And so though, though I've heard that there's still um, like some acceptance of them, because re remember, even as MBS and the younger generations embrace these reforms, you're still going to have to move an entire country that, has, um, that still holds to a very, very um, uh, specific and hardline approach to Islam and to uh, Sharia law. So you're, these, these reforms are going to take time. You have to exercise these muscles of proper self-governance. You do not get them overnight. And, and so you look at the fact that the, the religious police has been defanged, that women do have the ability to drive, that, um, that, uh, that the prince has now taken a stance where he allows the, 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 recognizes that the Israelis have a right to their own land. And right now you have, um, what I want to see too is somebody who, when I was there, I kept asking, I'm sure they regretted the fact that they invited me once I got there. Um, but I kept asking, and every time they said, we're making reforms, and I said, show me the nearest Christian church. Show me the nearest synagogue. Of course, there are no churches um, publicly uh, there in, in the entire country um, or synagogues, and they, and they you know, would say, you know, easy, easy. You know. but, um, but I want to see in 10 years, 20 years, a synagogue in Saudi Arabia. I want to see Baptists worshiping publicly in Saudi Arabia. Um, that is going to take time because you have to move the people at the pace that they're willing to move. And, and so... Um, um, I would just say that, that though some of these, um, some of his approaches, you know, what basically, just to understand it and not defend it, but just to understand it, what MBS is doing, it seems, is that he's making these reforms in a controlled way. So while he arrests the women who are out pushing and breaking the law to try to drive, he's arresting them and granting the right to drive because he wants to have a controlled approach. It's coming from him. It's not going to come from the people because he's looked at other revolutions like what happened to the Shah of Iran. Um, and, and so you can see how he's doing it. And by the way, I, I heard today, I don't know who they were, if they might be the specific one you mentioned, but the Saudis just released three of the women today from prison who um, were famously um, in jailed. Um, so uh, we continue to push on it, continue to talk about it, but also exercise some patience as he has a really large ship that he's trying to change directions with. And do you think Trump's policy uh, towards Saudi Arabia has been helping this slow push towards westernization, or has it been hindering it? I mean, it's one of those things where, so, you know, they say, do you want to credit Trump or do you want to credit MBS? I don't care who gets the credit for it. You can see that it's happening during the Trump administration. Um, this has been a very clear directional shift from empowering Iran to now trying to isolate Iran and look to Saudi Arabia as a leader in the region. And so he's backed MBS. He refuses to criticize him with any force publicly. It's the style of the president. And, and that's given the prince some, some room and some credibility and legitimacy um, with, with the regional power players. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't care who gets the credit for it, but it certainly is happening during this particular administration. Which, which Would you like issue? to respond? Or? Well, I, I give tr Trump credit for the crackdown on the 
on the women and on the, all the activists because the crown prince knows Trump doesn't care. And indeed, Trump can't even come out and admit the crown prince was responsible for Jamal's um, death, even though the CIA with high to, what is it, medium to high certainty said he is responsible. So I can see the reforms have been going on even starting under Abdullah. They have accelerated greatly under the crown prince, no doubt about it. Um, and he has a strategy. He's changing, he's breaking the compact that the, war, that the, house, the house of Saud has had with the religious establishment for, you know, 400 years. And he's shifting the base of support from the religious establishment, the number one constituency of the country for, for a very long time, to the young generation. Now, I agree with Rebecca, this is a very dangerous transition, switching your, the, your base of your support from religious leadership to, to a, the, a young generation that is not organized. And indeed, the government will not allow them to organize. They don't want them to organize. So exactly whether this shift is going to provoke a reaction from, from the right wing, from the, uh, from the uh, Wahhabi clerics, the way it did in 1979 when they seized, a group of them seized control of the, of the mosque in Mecca. We're waiting to see. But um, I, I think this is a very delicate internal moment for this. And also, the crown prince is not king yet. <laughs> so is he going to, when the king dies, he's 83 years old or 82, I think, 82 or 83, and not in very good health. When he dies, <coughs> is he going to be able to control the whole family? Or because he's alienated so many different branches of the family, will they try and turn on him? So that makes it even more delicate, this transition from, from the key constituency uh, inside the country for the royal family. I'm going to ask one final question before I turn uh, the audience over to some questions, which is um, something with Mrs. Heinrichs. Uh, do you see that there are growing differences between uh, the left and the right in the United States uh, with respect to Saudi Arabia policy and maybe the Middle East um, more, more generally, um, especially with recent discussion of the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, um, Ilham Omar, and the American Muslim community? What an easy question to end on. <laughs> Not, um, it's a very complex question. Um, lots of different political dimensions. Um, and and I, I don't want to get over my skis on that. But I, I, will, I will say that, number one, you have the problem of the fact that we have a very, um, we have a president that elicits a very emotional response from a lot of people in the country, especially the opposing political party. And so you, um, there is a tendency, I think it's fair to say, to reflexively disagree with the approach that the president's taking, regardless of what the issue is, with the maybe small the uh, criminal justice reform. But other than that, you, you do see a lot of political opposition. So it's hard for me to understand what to sift through it all and to kind of see what is really being opposed. Um, but, you, but, but I will say, and I think that this is fair, that you do have this rising um, generation of young Democrat leaders that are taking a much stauncher pro-Palestinian line and are much more bold in their approach to not just criticize Israel, but to criticize um, the influence of those who support uh, the, the sovereignty uh, and the protection and security of Israel, mainly APAC. Um, and, and that is something new. When I worked on, on, on Capitol Hill, you still had wide bipartisan support for Israel, and you didn't hear that kind of language openly discussed in the way that the young congressman has, congresswoman has, and the fact that she didn't get a, a, a clear um, reprimand and denunciation from Speaker Pelosi does not portend good things for the direction of the Democratic Party on the issue of Israel's security, in my view. Um, and so that does then affect, I think that it takes a much more pro-Palestinian, pro-Iran um, uh, uh, view 
of, of the direction that the United States should go, which is very, I mean, I would just say, I, I would think that would be a very bad thing for the United States. It's very good of all of the differences that Republicans and Democrats have. Surely we can come together and agree um, that, that peace and security in the region should, should be had with those countries that are not openly anti-American, like the Iranian government, um, that do not openly announce and desire the destruction of, of our closest ally, Israel. Um, and so it is concerning to me, um, but, and I will just say this last point, because I get to say it on my last um, stance, you know, in, in addition to MBS also just granting um, his verbal support for um, Israel having um, the right to its own land, for the first time, um, I, I don't know in, ever, but definitely in recent years, that the Saudi Arabia has opened its airspace for the first time to Israeli air aircraft. Um, that's a tangible, real thing we can point to for progress that wasn't there before. And, and then I would just say that, though we should care very much about human rights, uh, doing the moral thing does not require the United States to advantage those who seek to harm us. And to keep that in mind, if the moral thing requires harming one of our strategic allies and helping our adversary, in this case Iran, which would happen if the Saudi government was weakened, that is not something that morality would require from the United States. And so to, to, to keep that in mind as you try to consider these complex subjects. Mr. Otto, would you like to respond? Um, what strikes me is that a lot of Republicans are very anti-Saudi. This started with 9-11, and they've supported right through. They've, you know, two years ago when Obama was still there, they, the Congress supported stripping Saudi Arabia of diplomatic immunity so that the lawsuit against Saudi Arabia for its alleged involvement in uh, hijackers can go ahead, and it is going ahead. And a lot of Republicans voted for it. Lindsey Graham is one of the most anti-Saudi senators, uh, even compared to the Democrats. Um, so I think the Republican Party is quite split but a, a, a large number of Republicans are as anti-Saudi and as, as outraged over Jamal Khashoggi as you see in all these resolutions coming through the House and the Senate. And this is a, a bipartisan issue. It's not Republicans versus Democrats. Okay, well with that, are there any audience questions? Uh, follow up. First of all, this is an incredibly thoughtful and uh, provocative exchange, and you're both to be congratulated. Follow up on Khashoggi. If the United States had taken a public position uh, criticizing uh, the prince, what would have been the reaction of Saudi Arabia? What would have been the reaction of the people of Saudi Arabia? What would have been the impact? in the region? Simple. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I would just say, um, I can speculate that it, it wouldn't have been good. And, and so, and again, I would just say, we can, we can have our own view of what we think happened. We can believe that it was an intentional murder of, of the man. Um, uh, that's not what the Saudi government says, though I think we all recognize that it's still their fault. It was still, um, nobody, nobody moves outside the region without, without outside its borders, without the prince knowing about it and, and understanding what these henchmen were doing whenever they went to the consul. Um, but they've said that it was not, it didn't, it didn't go well. And I, would, and I would say that the reason I think that there's some um, credibility to that argument is it was a political disaster for the kingdom. So and to my mind, it, it seems plausible that it was an interrogation that went very, very badly. Um, now, Having said that, though, it's, um, uh, I, I think that the, that the other thing that we just have to keep in mind as we th think about that particular issue is the fact that Turkey has every um, interest in damaging our relationship with the Saudis and looking like the good guy here that's coming in and caring about human rights. Turkey is one of the worst places on the planet for journalists. And I found it galling and incredibly hypocritical and ridiculous that there were so many in the American commentariat that was giving anything, any credibility to anything that came out of the Turkish government. And that includes any of their media, which is Turkish owned. So I thought it was, a, it was a very strong propaganda campaign that came out of Turkey. And that's what fed the American media to try to figure out what was even happening there. And it did a real disservice to the truth and to, for the American people to understand what happened there. 
except most of what came out of Saudi Arabia, out of the Turkish security people, turned out to be true, including that he brought a sawbone, the 15 people that came from Saudi Arabia to bring back Khashoggi, alive or dead. Uh, and when you come to your consulate with a sawbone, it doesn't sound like something went awry. It was very deliberate. I think the least we can do is to insist that the crown prince's uh, right-hand person, a guy by the name of Saud al Qatani, who was also present in the torturing of women, be held accountable. At least that. As it is now, he's quote-unquote lost his job, although people see him walking around in, in the royal court as if everything's fine. And he's not among the 11 that are on trial. So the mastermind, the guy who actually carried this out and organized it, is, is walking around free. I think the least we can do is say that guy should be on trial with the other ones. But you've got to stand up and, and, and put an end to this. And trying to just talk you know, quietly to the king when you go and visit him, I, that's not enough because it's, it, it doesn't, you have to do some naming and shaming and raise the cost for this kind of behavior. And just whispering to the king and the crown prince, you know, when you see him in the, in the royal palace and talk about it for three minutes among all these other issues, that's not sufficient. So I, th I think we've got to name and shame. Um, thank you both for coming. Uh, so a, a question to both of you is just what sort of is the current state of human rights for women, religious minorities, homosexuals in Saudi Arabia, and how has it changed within the last five or ten years, um, and, and for journalists as well? And on that point, Mrs. Heinrichs, you, I believe earlier, uh, if it was your opening statement or at some point, mentioned that um, Jamal Khashoggi is not a journalist because he wrote opinion pieces. Um, and sure. But in criticizing Turkey, you just said, you know, they have a terrible record on right. journalist rights. Regardless of whether he's a journalist or not, um, if he is not an opinion writer, does that change your position on his death? Yeah. Great question. I'll, and I'm happy to explain that. Um, the reason I made that distinction is this. The narrative that we were fed by the Turkish government and that was repeated often in mainstream media, uncritically looking at the information that was coming out of Turkish media, was that Jamal Khashoggi was a, he, it, was symbol, it was symbolic of journalism at large. It was a, he worked at the Washington Post, he was for freedom and democracy, and he's, or he, it, it created this character, characterization of him to be something bigger than, than the man himself. And I think that it confused the, the situation a little bit. Um, and the fact that he worked for the Washington Post does mean something, but again, he wasn't, he was not even a legal permanent resident and he wasn't an American citizen. And though you say, but does that affect the morality or does it, you know, does it affect the, it, it, it grants different legal ramifications for what happened. Um, is he created by God and deserving of dignity and respect? Yes, he is. But does his death and the way it happened have the same would have the same reaction if, for instance, he was one of our own reporters who we see at the White House um, who is an American citizen who that happened to. Can you imagine how different that would be? And so while it's a shame, you can see he was a political enemy of the, of the prince. Um, he, I don't, and I don't want to get into it, because, out of, just even out of respect, because of the friendship that was there. Um, but I would just say it was a complex situation in which it... Um, um, I, I, I'm, a, I'm very sad, I'm upset, I'm, I wish it hadn't happened the way it did, but due to his particular legal status and his relationship to the kingdom, it, you can see that it's different than, than if he was a particular, if different citizenship and different um, uh, approach to his writing. Um, he, he was writing things that criticized, um, yeah, some of the approach to MBS. So that, that's why I said that, was just because I think it's a fair way to understand sort of what happened. And then it's sort of I interesting, I just want to make the other point that, you know, we can focus on this particular death, and it was terrible, but strangely, sort of kind of changing, turning the argument on its head, 
I would say it's not even the worst thing the Saudis have done in the last year or two. So we were focused on this particular thing because it became this sort of metaphorical warring between you know, op open de democratic ideals and democracy and, and freedom of the press versus you know, authoritarianism. But again, the Saudi government, you ask me what the state is, um, it, uh, homosexuality is, is punishable by, it might be a capital crime still in Saudi, I know it is in Iran, um, in, in, in many places in the, in the Muslim world. Um, it, you, you are allowed to be a different religion as long as you worship privately. If you're a Saudi citizen, converting to a different faith is punishable by death. Um, like I said, there's not a synagogue or a Christian church anywhere in the entire country. Um, women um, are still essentially property of the men, of their guardians. You still need a brother or a dad or a husband that can sign you a permission slip to leave the house. Um, so you, you still have a long way to go, which is why I say these reforms that MBS is making are very important. And, um, and you don't want to overstate them, but again, if you compare to where we are, were even a couple of years ago with the defanging of the religious police, granting women the ability to drive, um, they are making progress. In, and the fact that MBS has made the statement that um, many decades ago that, that, that you did have more religious tolerance and freedom, the fact that he said that's even a desirable thing means a lot. I would say that under Abdullah, there were two periods, this first five years. And, I, and I, I looked at the human rights reports on Saudi Arabia as kind of a barometer. And when Ab Abdullah first became king, the uh, first few years, he really started to open up the place. And human rights was just pretty hard on everybody, you know, on human rights issues. Gave him um, pretty good marks. They were going in the right direction. The last years of Abdullah um, it began to tighten up, and this has accelerated greatly under uh, Mohammed bin Salman, who just doesn't want any kind of activism from anybody. You know, there are no labor unions. There are there are very few. Uh, there's one official human rights group, <laughs> but there are very few. No political, all the, all the political human rights groups, they're all in jail. Um, so he has just decided no activism. And to my mind, I think of it, Saudis were beginning to become citizens. They were they're beginning to participate in elections. The women were beginning to stand for election and participate in elections. And now he's turning them back into subjects. And I will bestow on you what I feel like bestowing on you, and you can thank me. But I'm not going to do it because of any activism or any demand from anybody in the society. That's kind of his attitude. He doesn't want, exactly like Sisi in Egypt, by the way. I mean, it's, it's not an isolated phenomenon. And Turkey is terrible, too. I mean, it, I totally agree with the, you know, the way they've been, there are more Turkish journalists in jail, I think, than any the other, other country. Yeah. So I, it's, um, anyway. Uh, I, I echo the sentiments and thanking you guys for coming, and it's been really fascinating. One thing that I'm wondering about is kind of what you think of the average, in talking about Saudi Arabia versus Iran, I kind of see it as we have the average Saudi Arabian is, is kind of quite extreme as well. As you said, like the religious constituency in Saudi Arabia is a very important one. Um, in Iran, I think there's at least a narrative, and I'm not sure if it's true, that you know, there was a, a robust Persian middle class that developed under the Shah that was somewhat Western um, and that their liberal somewhat liberal values have been oppressed by this new theocracy, um, by the Ayatollah. And so that in one country, you have a regime, we're not sure exactly where the Saudi regime stands, they're kind of more pragmatic, but they have a constituency that is very fundamentalist religious. In Iran, there might be people that actually could be more sympathetic and share more values with us. Um, given that, like how do you kind of look at our relationships with both countries given that I think we do have more in common with the Iranian people but in the same way, 
the Saudi government keeps a people that we would really clash with in check. Um, so there's a geopolitical benefit in that. So would love to hear what you guys think Very about that. Interesting. I, that's a very interesting um, way to put that question. And that's why we take two different approaches to the countries. In the case of Iran, the United States government constantly says um, that we support the Iranian people. We support the Iranian people. One of the biggest criticisms of the Obama administration is that it didn't get behind the, um, the what's it, the Green the Green Revolution. Green movement or whatever. Yeah, the Green, Green Revolution. <laughs> um, that he was quiet and supported the regime. No, 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 you support the, the Iranian people because they're the ones, and there, there you have a, an, an example of a country that, like in the past, it's coming up and, it, and it, it recognizes that all of these sanctions relief that the Iranian government said that they wanted to help their economy and help their people, they used to build missiles, they used to build um, more um, weaponry, and then to export it throughout the region, to, to give it to the Houthis in Yemen. To, to destabilize um, the, the entire region, to, to prop up Assad. All of these sanctions relief, courtesy of the American people, is now propping up Assad in Syria. This, these were some of the reasons, some of the concerns that so many people opposed the Iran deal was because that we, but without actually even removing the, the, um, the actual uh, nuclear program, we were enabling and empowering the Iranian dream to continue its malign efforts throughout the region. And in the case of Saudi Arabia, much different approach. We're supporting the MBS and his because what he's doing is he's taking a much more controlled. Again, you've got young people. I mean, I, sp I spoke with them while we were there. We had a whisper, but we spoke, we talked. And, I, and there is, there is, especially among the women who have a very, they've had a taste of liberty and of, and, and of um, independence. And they do want it, but you have an older generation that still is very um, closed. The, Saudi Arabia is the home of Mecca and Medina. Okay, so you, you, you need to just need to understand and, and put it in its own context about that's why it would be so incredibly good, not only just for the Arab world, but for the Muslim world to see a more moderate understanding of Islam being applied there. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question, but it does show you that, that this, why this, this, this particular question requires some finesse and um, a little bit more nuance. We, we don't take the same approach to every single country in the region, and that's a very interesting dynamic between the people and the government. But I would just emphasize the point that the bulk of the Saudi government is still, or of the Saudi people are still young. You've got a lot of young people that are coming up that, um, you know, they've got, we've got men now, I've heard, which is amazing considering when I was just there 10 years ago, men now that are, you know, in their 20s that they're allowed, that, because the religious police aren't there, they're, they're, they're just hanging out in restaurants in ball caps and t-shirts. You have women that now have more um, bejeweled, bedazzled abayas that they're wearing out in Jeddah. And they're like showing a little ankle <laughs> and they're not getting arrested. I mean, you say, you're like, oh, who cares about ankles? That's a big deal. So, um, I'm, I'm, I would just say, and this is one of the things, freedom begets freedom. Okay, independence begets, you want a little bit of independence, these women, you start letting women drive, pick up their own kids from school, going to the doctors themselves without, you know, now they're not going to want permission, and they're going to start pushing a little harder. And MBS knows that, which is why he's trying to control it so that it doesn't get out of hand. Uh, I think you had a two-part question. Um, I wrote a piece, I don't know, last year about the, the, the Wahhabi establishment has been silent in the midst of all these reforms. I quoted what the Mufti said three years ago about music, about all the stuff that's happening now. He said it's haram, forbidden, religiously forbidden. Mm -hmm. The unofficial Wahhabi clerics have a huge following. I mean like millions of followers. And they're, they're on the conservative side, for the most part. So there, there is this huge uh, following for the conservative cler clerics. Now, these guys are most all in jail now, precisely because they have large followings. But that doesn't mean you're not going to have some explosions coming on the part of conservative elements. On the other issue of the class, Saudi Arabia is only now developing a sizable middle class. Iran has had a middle class for decades. Saudi Arabia is now developing with these people. By the way, there are more women coming out of university, universities in Saudi Arabia at home and abroad than there are men. And um, 
this flux coming back is the new middle class of Saudi Arabia in formation. Is it going to be activist? Is it going to put up with you know no activism of any kind? Is it you know is it going to be start to uh, make demands um, on the government either through social media or organizing groups? That, that's a very interesting question. But we haven't had what I'd call a, a, a sort of a critical mass of potential middle class Saudis before the last decade. And it's now in the making. And we don't know what they're going to demand or what. But, you know, I used to feel that the women were the chief agents of change in Saudi Arabia. They were the ones that were pushing. And my feeling was that the, 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 the government didn't mind making concessions because they were not going to be a political problem. <laughs> well, Crown Prince has decided maybe they are going to be a, a, a problem for him. In their activism and so he's trying to sort of stop the whole movement among women of being political activists and then now they're concentrating on issues of um, the guardianship and they're slowly chipping away at that um, women can now work in many areas they couldn't work before in fact I did this this last week 11 of them have begun being air, contra air traffic controllers, 11. So they're, they're not, they can now be lawyers in the courts. They're, they're opening up new sectors uh, slowly. Um, but they are still, even though th without their activism, watching what's happening to Saudi women is really a very good indicator to me for the degree of change taking place in the country. And I would just say on that point too, because it, and it's not as though, and I'm not much saying that MBS is this great, fantastic champion of women in, in, in civil rights, and that's not, that's not, I think that that would be a totally ridiculous thing to put on him in terms of what his passion is. He is interested in diversifying the economy and moving from strictly as an oil export and had the entire economy based on that to diversifying the economy. And key to diversifying the economy is what do you do with all of these now educated women? Well, they can contribute to the economy. And so they go hand in glove. And that's where that interest is. Um, and then I would just, one little point just to think about too, when you think about education, yes, women are being educated. It's still the wealthy women in, in Saudi Arabia that, that are being educated. And they're being educated still separately from men. But I had the opportunity to visit the first female they're all you know, only female, but the first female um, university in Saudi Arabia when I was there. And we had an opportunity during the Q&A section for, for the, um, the American the congressional staffers to ask a question to the female undergrads. And the question I asked was, do you feel like you are allowed to have a free exchange of ideas like what we're doing here? And they said, yes, yes, we do. And there's a couple of male teachers that were sitting you know, behind them, their professors. And I, and I said, um, are you, that's interesting, I said, are you permitted to take the Quran and have a discussion about how the Quran affects how you live your life? <gasps> you know, and they immediately, and I could even see like the men were like, the, the male teachers that were behind him kind of like got a little nervous, like how are they gonna answer this? Are we gonna have to like, you know, and they kind of came to, oh no, 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 no. The reason I asked that, not just to be the gadfly in the room, the American woman sending her there was, was, but the reason that's important is why? Why is that important? Because that's the key to a liberal, a, a truly liberal arts education. We can all be here with different um, religious convictions and I can talk about the Bible's effect on constitutionalism and I can, and I can, and somebody else can talk about old mosaic law. We can have this conversation and maybe we might get our feelings hurt now and again, but we're still going to walk out of here, Americans, with no, you know, there's no, we have a free exchange of ideas and we can take our own religious, deeply held convictions and put them up against one another's and have this robust debate. And that is an indicator of a truly free society. And so what I, what, what I wanted to sort of push on a little bit is, Y'all know Aristotle. You used to. You used to. Um, um, uh, the, the, the country um, has this um, robust heritage and under, understanding of some of the great thinkers. And so, you know, I wanted to, to sort of just encourage a little bit to say if you still have a part of thought that you're not allowed to challenge, you're not there yet. Okay, well, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, 
Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you both for coming here. I uh, just wanted to, I guess, talk about it. it seemed like there was an emerging theme in this debate about human rights being the point of conten contention in between U.S. and Saudi re relations. But I wanted to learn more about both of your perspectives on uh, Saudi Arabia's vision for uh, competing with the U.S. in the oil market. And I was wondering if you believed that Saudi Arabia was willing to cooperate more with the U.S. or if they were going to take another angle uh, by being as leaders of OPEC um, and distancing themselves from the U.S. and working to create more allies uh, who are willing to uh, compete against the U.S. Uh, as a singular group? Well, the Saudis are reducing right now. They used to pr produce over 10 million barrels a day. They're headed for less than 10 million barrels a day because they're trying to force up the price. Trump keeps saying the price is too high, go down, go down. There's no sign of cooperation. He just tweeted it today, I think. Did he? He tweeted <laughs> it today. He dropped the price of oil. Today. <laughs> and Saudi Arabia, um, we used to be there, really cooperate with them, even in setting prices. I mean, I wrote a book about Bonder, and Bonder used to go in the White House, and they'd ask him, can you raise the price or lower the price? And, you know, they would respond, no more, no more. They're doing, they're doing their own thing uh, because in order to break even, they need, for their budget and their capital budget, they need to break even about $80, $85. And now the price is... Uh, well, it depends which market, but here it's like less than 60. And the Brent, Brent, which is the other sort of marker, is like 65. It's in Europe. And um, so they want to get the price up. And their, their number one person, their, uh, country they're cooperating with, Russia. And what's happening is that OPEC, or the Saudis are going beyond OPEC to find allies to try and force the price up or down, or mostly up now. Um, so it's kind of a different game, and, and it's quite interesting to see this really growing antagonism between the Saudis and the Americans. Now, the Saudis have a, have a strategy of going, what they say, going downstream. Well, you may not know it, but the biggest refinery in the United States is owned by Saudi Arabia, down in Port Arthur, Texas. It's the biggest refinery. They're doing the same thing. They're getting into the refineries and so that they can, they can lock in markets in China and India and Pakistan, building refineries uh, and also uh, petrochemical plants that will use their products. So they're developing, they're on, a, they're on a rage. They know what they want, what they want to do and where they want to go on oil. And, um, you know, they're, they're going to be in conflict with fracking oil. You know, we're, we're going up more than 12 million barrels a day now. And the Saudis are under 10 million barrels a day. And we're going up to 13 million barrels next year. So we're, we're, we're really, that, that part of the pillar of our relationship has really crumbled. Well, if that's all, I'd like to give both of you an opportunity <laughs> to give a, a final closing statement, just two minutes each. Um, so I think uh, we'll start with Mr. Ottaway and then close. Do you want me to go since you go just ahead. gave a great, yeah. I, I mean, I'm just going to reiterate just some of the things that I already said. I'm just, I want to quote the president's tweet since we just talked about it. He said, very important that OPEC increase the flow of oil. World markets are fragile. Price of oil getting too high. Too high. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and oil is capitalized also um, for effect. Uh, no, I... You know, I, um, again, you know, I think we agree that there's lots of improvements that are needed uh, in, in that um, country. And I think that when you're, when you're talking about the Middle East, you always have to um, resist the urge to grade it based on what we see in our own country. And this is something that Americans tend to do all the time. Um, and remember that democracy, we're a republic. We are a democratic republic. Um, but democracy isn't always the urgent thing that we should be pushing for. It's justice. And if we can move towards a more just society in the Saudi government, and if they're actually working in line with the United States and the region, which so far that they are, um, and if they are pushing back 
um, the, the influence of Iran, working with the United States in counterintelligence information, um, and improving the, the, um, the, the lives of their own people, that's a trajectory that we want to continue moving on. Now, it's going to take some finesse, it's going to take patience, and it's going to take time um, for all of those things to continue. But right now, um, this is uh, a very encouraging development that's happened between the two countries, and, um, and, and, and especially because the prince is so young and does have sort of a, a, an understanding of where the young uh, population of that country um, is. And, and remember, you know, we're, we're, we're looking for stability in the Middle East. And uh, stability in the Middle East, this constant elusive thing that every American president and government, I believe, is searching for. Um, this is the best bet for that in the short, medium, long term. And, um, and it's worth our support and encouragement. Mr. Otto, would you like the final word? Well, um, I'm much less optimistic. I just see issues piling one on top of the other in our relationship. And um, the Yemeni war and this boycott of Saudi Arabia, of, of Qatar, organized by Saudi Arabia, we're discovering that the United Arab Emirates are much better military allies on the ground than the Saudis. And we are discovering that Qatar is far more important because it's the, it's the home base for all our military operations from Afghanistan to Syria, that Qatar is much more important militarily than Saudi Arabia. So what I think we gotta do, and I don't, again, I go back to what happened in 2005, but the two governments sit down and figure out what we have in common, where we're going, and what we can work on together. As I said, in fighting Al-Qaeda, the United Arab Emirates has been our primary partner in Yemen. And I, you know, in theory, we're both allies in the struggle against Iran and the struggle against counterterrorism. I frankly don't know what the Saudis are doing in the struggle against counterterrorism. We, we do swap information about people that may be troublemakers. Which is, which is certainly a good, you know, a good, good to have. But what I don't see us doing operations together anywhere. Uh, they do fly some planes. They did fly some planes in Syria and part of the coalition there. Um, but on the ground, they're doing nothing. And it's the UAE that's expanding, expanding its power in, in the, in the, uh, to, to protect the Bab al-Mandeb which is an extremely important waterway together with the Homo Strait. And I, I see all these issues between us and the Saudis. We, we still have 9-11. What is it now? It's 18 years later? There's still a suit out there. And, the, and, and, and um, now we have the Khashoggi thing. Then we have the thing about, uh, are we going to share nuclear technology with them? And the Congress doesn't want to do it, and <laughs> neither do you. <laughs> Uh, so it, I just see issue after issue piling upon our relationship. And unless we can sit down and say, okay, this is what we're going to do together and this is what uh, this relationship is all about, et cetera, et cetera, I think it's just going to crumble and become less and less important the way it is in oil, where we've gone from being partners to uh, competitors. Um, we should be cooperating on Iran. But how do you cooperate with Iran when Saudi Arabia is arguing with our number one ally out there, Qatar, where all our assets are based, and three of the six Arab Gulf states don't want to take on Iran? I'm talking about Kuwait, Oman, and Qatar. That's three of the six forming the Gulf Cooperation Council. They're the Arab monarchies of the Gulf. You know. We're in disarray. They're in disarray. We can't care more than they do about Iran. If they care so much about Iran, they've they got to get their act together. and We've got to put pressure on them to stop this squabbling among themselves, which would then show that they really do think Iran is the number one issue for them. All right. Well, I want to <laughs> please join me in thanking our two guests for what I thought was a very engaging. <laughs>